Boozed and Confused is a comedy and weird topic podcast. Adult language may be used probably by me. While our episode topics may be educational in nature, we are not responsible if your children start dropping the F-bomb to their kindergarten class. Listener discretion is advised. Hello, everybody. Oh, didn't see you there. Hi. No. Yeah. Hey. Hello. Hello, team. How's it going? It's going. Y- yep. It's going is the mantra of 2020. We got our lights up. Yeah. Got Christmas lights up. On the roof. On the roof. Before we get any further about Christmas joy, I'm Carol Ann. Oh, um, um, shoot. Uh, I'm Matt. And this is Boost and Confused. Boost and Confused. Welcome to another episode. And this one is pretty wild. So, this is one of them. Yeah. Strap in because uh, it's it's crazy. Buckle in, buckaroos. <laughs> if you are joining us for the first time, welcome. Uh, Boost and Confused is a podcast about weird topics on the internet. Before we dive into this week's topic that we are hyping up a lot and I hope it lives up to the hype because otherwise this is really embarrassing. A couple of notes. Uh, The first note is um, we are available on all of your favorite podcast platforms uh, including I think most people use Apple podcasts uh, but Spotify, iHeartRadio or media whatever it's called, Google Podcasts, literally anywhere. We are also available on all of your favorite social media platforms, including Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And if social media isn't your jam, that's totally fine. Uh, You can shoot us an email at boostandconfusedpodcast at gmail.com. We would love to hear from you if you've got a creepy story or some kind of cryptid encounter or maybe you grew up in a haunted house. We would love to hear about it. Uh, and probably feature your story on the pod. So send us a note. And the last note is if you enjoy our podcast, whether this is your first time joining or uh, you've listened to every episode, the best way that you could support us besides just telling your friends, your parents uh, to listen is by leaving us a review on the platform that you listen on. It really does help other people find us um, outside of just word of mouth. It pretty much just tells the algorithm that we are worth listening to. So it would be super appreciated. And the best part is that if you were to um, leave us a review on your platform of choice and take a screenshot and send it to us, we are super duper happy to send you some Boost and Confuse stickers for free as a token of our appreciation. And unending gratitude. Yes. Um, and really, if I'm sure we are not the only podcast that you listen to, so be sure to leave some love for the other podcasts that you listen to as well. I know that they would really appreciate it, I'm sure, and it really does help um, everybody out. With those housekeeping items being out of the way, what are you drinking today? Uh, you know, this is my favorite part of the housekeeping. Um, I'm actually taking a bit of a change and having some nice spicy mead Uh, it is wonderfully spicy Uh, we actually just went to the wild blossom meadery and winery in chicago uh, very close to home Uh, and i'm drinking pirate's blood it is a really cool um what is like a a bottle yeah it's a really cool bottle it's like a skull Uh, and it's super spicy but it is also very sweet and it leaves a wonderful aftertaste and Uh, It just looks really cool in my goblet. And it's also 12% ABV. Oh, baby. (laughs) It's my favorite part. No, it's actually really good. Um, Beautifully spicy and sweet. It's very uh, complex. I feel very classy and like a pirate. And it's local. so Shop local. Support your local businesses, y'all. Especially right now. Especially Wild Blossom Eatery and Winery. (laughs) I know I will. And with all the housekeeping items all wrapped up, what are we talking about today? Besides how spicy and sweet this meat is, uh, Nazis and meth. (laughs) Not just meth. 
not just meth. Uh, I think in a, in a broader sense, it's uh, drug use and the Nazis. rise and the rise of the Third Reich. <laughs> oh, you know, if I had to make a top ten list of things that I hated in the history of humanity, um, I don't think I could put it in a proper top ten. But like easily, easily number one is Nazis. Yeah. Um, somewhere in that list is people who don't use the blinker on their car when they change lanes. Yep. Um, our stupid cat Apollo. Mm-hmm. Um, no, and- he's, he's, a good, <laughs> he's a good boy. Look, literally whenever we sit down, it's like he knows to start screaming. Yeah. Well, you know, um, I hate aimbot hackers, uh, league of legends players, no, not players. I would just say the community in general is so toxic. It's Very so toxic. bad. Very toxic. Very uh, toxic. Creamy peanut butter. Yeah. And meth. Yep. That's not 10. Yeah. It's not. It's also not hated in that order, I don't think. No. But Nazis is definitely number one. Yeah. But yeah, we're going to do drugs and Nazis. So I guess to kind of get into this curious topic i want to do a little background on kind of what got the nazis there in the first place kind of like where do they come from well this is kind of where they came from when a daddy nazi loves a mommy nazi they (sighs) nazis aren't born they're they're definitely created you're not born a Nazi. You might be born into a Nazi family, but you're not born a Nazi. Yeah, that's fair. Like, it's important we talk about how Germany got their foot in the door in the first place with like drugs and research and the development of drugs. But to really get to understand how the Germans slash the Nazis did this is to understand like post World War One Germany, which was in shambles. Yeah, it wasn't doing so hot. It's not no, not, not a not good a time. Great time. Not, not a, a good time. time. No, no. <laughs> so the former emperor, I guess, well, the emperor at one time of Germany and Prussia, Kaiser Wilhelm II, uh, renounced his throne in 1918, and the Weimar Republic was formed the day after uh, Kaiser Wilhelm stepped down. And about a year later, the Treaty of Versailles was signed, uh, 28th of June, 1919. And pretty much Germany was held responsible for World War I. And this treaty basically threw the book at them, at, uh, at Germany. They lost territory. They had to pay massive reparations. They were forced to minimize their military. All these things were, you know, because they blamed them. While not really addressing the powder keg that led to World War I, the Treaty of Versailles definitely humiliated the crap out of Germany. And so the Weimar Republic, which was, again, formed the day after Kaiser Wilhelm uh, abdicated, they sought to rebuild the German people after the ramifications of Versailles. And on August 11th of 1919, the Weimar Constitution was signed into law despite strong opposition from both the military and leftists. Uh, and on paper, the Constitution looks pretty good. Uh, it has over 180 articles. Uh, here are a few of them. Uh, they promised democracy to the people. There were checks and balances in the whoosh, whoosh, government. They guaranteed equality and civil rights to all Germans. They promised freedom of peaceful assembly, uh, expression, and they even offered free public mandatory state-run education. This all sounds great to me. Right? Uh, what's the catch? There was an article, uh, Article 48, thrown in there all willy-nilly, pretty much stating that the president, under certain circumstances, can take emergency measures without the prior consent of the Reichstag, which was the parliament, the check and balance. You know, just a little, just in case thing in there and it's not even like the first one or the last one it's like number 48 it's just you know in there this is why people need to read the terms and conditions just saying (laughs) no one does that no one does that so 
they have a new government and they are still facing the Treaty of Versailles demands. And so since Germany was still under the restrictions of the Treaty of Versailles, foreign forces from Belgium and France occupied many industrial sites in Germany. Uh, pretty much Germany was saying, hey, we can't pay you. And they were like, uh, yeah, you can. So we're going to watch you. So the Weimar government suggested to the workers that they passively go on strike. And this ends up tanking the German economy. So in response, the government just, like, makes more money. Yeah, I don't understand why that's a problem. This is the problem. Uh, inflation... <laughs> I'm just kidding, guys. I understand inflation, okay? In case my dad listens to this. <laughs> inflation skyrockets, and many people lose all that they have. Pretty much if... The Germans said they couldn't pay things off before. Now they definitely can't. So to help things out with the Great Depression of Germany. Did they print more money? <laughs> <laughs> no, that made things worse. That made things way worse. Uh, actually, the U.S. gets involved, and U.S. banker Charles Dawes helps outline a plan to help the ravaged country continue to pay their reparations. That and some good old USD pumped into the German economy help stabilize things, and things look pretty good for a while. Uh, unfortunately, the U.S. also has their own depression, a Great Depression, and this sees any U.S. financial support pretty much dry up in Germany. And this time around, the middle class takes the big brunt of the new depression, and many Germans grow weary and distrustful of their government leaders. So what do they do? Well, they turn to the extremes, and they look to uh, parties such as the Nazi party led by Adolf Hitler, who I actually didn't know this. He had a number of failed attempts to start a national revolution, uh, but by 1932, the Nazi party becomes the largest political party in the German parliament. And after a brief fight for power, Hitler was named chancellor in 1933. And within weeks, he declares Article 48 of the Weimar Constitution to quash any civil rights and suppress members of the Communist Party, which many people feared. And by 1933, Hitler introduced the Enabling Act, which pretty much gave him absolute power as he no longer had to face checks or balances. And there it is. Uh, Nazi Germany is born from the chaos of a failed Weimar government. And I actually understand the game Secret Hitler now. Yeah, it makes a lot more sense. All that chancellor thing, president thing, it all makes a lot of sense. So there it is. There's a uh, a really, really, really quick look at what led to the Nazis. So how do we go from Nazis to uh, drugs? N Nazis on meth? Sign me up to not be a part of that. Yeah, no, thank you. My, nope. My, um, I called my mom and asked, and she said no, so sorry. <laughs> I can't <laughs> join. All right, so before we move forward in history, we're moving backwards again. Just bear with me for a minute here. So... Before World War I, German universities and German corporations had a collaboration on research efforts, which created a worldwide monopoly of drugs for the German corporate sector, which was great for them. This was specifically for the drugs that required chemical expertise and industrial capacity, both of which Germany had and uh, were pretty great for. So... How did they fund all of this? Because as we know, it is pretty expensive to do any sort of research or development into any pharmaceuticals. Turns out <laughs> morphine is incredibly profitable. And so Germany took the revenue from the morphine sales uh, that they had and used it to fuel this research. So a little bit of backstory into this. Morphine was discovered and patented in the early 19th century by Germans. So these German pharmaceutical companies found huge success with morphine and its derivatives, like using it as pain relievers and cough suppressants and buyer, which... That rings a bell. 
I think is a pretty household name by now, was um, credited for recognizing how potent heroin was, uh, which I don't know if I'd want that credit. (laughs) (laughs) This heroin is pretty good. And so heroin was totally legal at this time in Germany. So during the German Empire, the government's militaristic inclinations prompted it to add additional financial support to research in sectors including pharmaceuticals and optimization of industrial processes. So to wrap this section up, how we had previously said World War I wasn't really a great time, uh, you know, in Germany during or after, the casualties of World War I brought the need for treatment of acute and chronic pain And uh, the means of treating that pain and the side effects of that treatment, including opioid dependence, came to the forefront of public consciousness. So getting into the civilian part of the drug policy in Nazi Germany, after World War I, the Weimar and Nazi governments adopted what was pretty much an attitude that's the opposite of the D.A.R.E. program for anybody (laughs) who's had the misfortune of taking that program. Um, D, I won't do drugs. I won't have an attitude. So Matt and I just had a sidebar. Uh, did everyone who go through the D.A.R.E. program, like, was it like half and half on whether or not you learned the song? Because there's definitely a song with it. I never sang a song. I thought it was drug and alcohol resistance education. And I thought tobacco was called Tabasco. And the constable... <laughs> I'd maybe keep that to yourself. No, I am. I am airing my laundry. The... The sheriff or the constable, who whoever whoever was teaching our class, like, laughed at me. Yeah. Yeah, I could see that. But I feel like, I mean, if you look into the stats around the D.A.R.E. program, I think it actually did more harm than good. But the problem with the D.A.R.E. program is they'd be like, hey, kids. <laughs> you want to know what drugs are? Here's what they are, and here's how you use them. There's, there's these drug dealers that hang out at the corner of 18th and and. Pulaski and uh here's how you can buy the drugs <laughs> but don't do it they're here from 3 to 7 p.m monday through friday don't don't go see them though <laughs> don't tell them that i sent you <laughs> yeah so it didn't really set kids up for success but uh the germans um not the germans i will say the weimar and the nazi governments uh because very different things from Germans. Uh, So they opted towards having this attitude of tolerance and acceptance um, towards drugs specifically that were meant to relieve pain or increase performance and avoid withdrawal. And most of these drugs were just universally okay or people had prescriptions for them. And it's pretty worth noting that most of these drug addicts in the 20s and 30s uh, in Germany were First World War veterans who required addictive drugs for pain relief and or medical personnel who had access to such drugs. And this is all interesting because the Nazi ideology is actually uh, pretty fundamentalist in its anti-drug stance. Social use of drugs was considered a sign of personal weakness and a symbol of the country's moral decay in the wake of traumatic and humiliating defeat in World War I. Yeah, uh, the Aryan race, which was the embodiment of human perfection and nazi ideology um they they wanted their people to be superhumans you know they wanted the ubermensch and hitler even said once we don't need weak people we want only the strong weak people who take drugs like opium to escape we don't want them we want strong people who take methamphetamine to feel (laughs) even stronger that's who we want. Yeah. So basically, uh, you can't smoke pot just to like feel a little bit better after a rough day, but you could totally smoke meth if you feel like you got a toothache or something. It makes you strong. And uh, symptoms of drug addiction were almost always attributed to other conditions. So they would say, you're not actually drug addicted. You have this condition instead, and drug addiction is just a side effect. <laughs> um, and so these um, other conditions were often pseudoscientifically diagnosed. Is that alternative science? <laughs> yes. Funny how things always come back to repeat themselves. Back in the time machine we go. Back to the future. No, the past. No, it's the past now, but it's the future of 
World War One. So we're in World War Two now. That's what I'm saying. We're in World War Two, and drug use in the German military during World War Two was actively encouraged and quite widespread, especially during the war's later stages as the Wehrmacht became depleted. If you're anything like me and didn't know what that word meant, the Wehrmacht was the unified armed forces of Nazi Germany from 1935 all the way to 1945. And so as the forces became depleted, the country became more dependent on inexperienced young fighters as opposed to the grizzled veterans of the battlefield to make their frontline soldiers and fighter pilots fight longer, harder, and with less concern for individual safety, the Nazi army ordered them to take military-issued pills made from methamphetamine and a primarily cocaine-based stimulant. So they're basically trying to make some fucking urukai to, like, go fight in the war because they're losing the battle. <laughs> Looks like meat's back on the menu tonight, uh, boys. Also, how did Urkai even know what a menu was? Okay, Investigate, right, investigate. Right. I want to know the answers. And how could they not shoot that guy who was carrying the giant powder I know. keg? You, you, had, you had one job. But also, you know, before we go any further, it's worth noting, Germany was not the first or the only country to give uh, its army or its, you know, military... Uh, pills to take that were just like stimulant drugs um definitely not the first time or the last time in history that that's done by 1938 the drug pervitin was introduced and it quickly became a top seller among the german population what is pervitin you ask <laughs> let them know what is it we should make a uh like modern day pharmaceutical commercial where it goes through all the side effects where it's like a happy couple dancing in a field but then it's like side effects may include suicide. your legs falling off <laughs> pervitin is straight up just methamphetamine so this this new drug developed by the berlin-based temmler pharmaceutical company uh, had some effects and the effects of the amphetamines are similar to those of the adrenaline produced by the body, triggering a heightened state of alertness. In most people, the substance increases self-confidence, concentration, and willingness to take risks while at the same time reducing sensitivity to pain, hunger, or the need for sleep. I feel like a lot of college students who have taken Adderall for the first time during finals week probably uh, find some similarities in that, except it's not meth, so there's that. It's not meth. That should be their <laughs> slogan. Adderall. It's not meth. <laughs> yeah. Um, I bet if I took uh, Adderall, I would probably spend hours doing useless things like... Watching YouTube videos of um, top 10 compilations. <laughs> top 10 enemy betrayals. <laughs> Calling out you, watch Mojo. Uh, Nani? Oh my wa, moishi no. Okay, back, back, so no, back to drugs, back to drugs. The, the drug was brought to the attention of Otto Frederick Rank, a military doctor and director of the Institute for General and Defense Physiology at Berlin's Academy of Military Medicine. And by September of 1939, Ronk tested the drug on 90 university students, and he came to the conclusion that Pervitin could help the Wehrmacht win the war. I think by having all the soldiers take meth, uh, we, we, we got a pretty good chance. <laughs> we got this. Call Hitler. Let him know. <laughs> so, uh, cocaine, whose effects substantially overlap with those of amphetamine but feature things like greater euphoria was later added to the formula to increase its potency through the multiplicative effects of drug interaction and to reinforce its use by individuals this is a complete sidebar i did not realize until maybe a couple of years ago uh how common coke is like I know people joke it's like the businessman's drug or it's like the party drug. Had no idea how common it was. Um, yeah, no. 
Well, I was today years old when I learned about this in general. <laughs> so after discovering this, and it became a pretty popular thing, medical authorities described this plan under which they distributed uh, millions of pills uh, as having negative consequences that many soldiers became addicted to drugs and useless in any military capacity, whether uh, fighting or supporting. <laughs> I'm just cackling at the idea where they're like, the realization that all the generals have where they're like, oh shit, they're all addicted to meth. <laughs> <laughs> They fight so good for like 10 minutes, and then they all just get really tired. Do you think they took the same approach as they took um, with the, the poor economy and just printed more money, but instead just gave them more drugs? Give them more <laughs> meth. Oh, gosh. Well, it unfortunately was not just drugs that the military got addicted to. Um, alcohol use and abuse was uh, rampant within the military. You don't say. Yeah. Turns out a lot of them were raging alcoholics, uh, probably on accident. So at first, um, high-ranking officials within the Wehrmacht encouraged alcohol use as a means of relaxation and a crude method of mitigating the psychological effects of combat, which, if you think about it, is really just a kind of fucked up way of being like, we understand that you've been through a lot psychologically, and that's probably just your way of uh, blocking those traumatic memories. I'm also getting some more Urukai oh damn Urukai vibes here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the grog. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, and the meat just being back on the menu. Just load them up, boys. Boys. So after the fall of France, commanders observed that their soldiers' behavior was deteriorating much in the same way of realizing that they were all meth addicts um, at their own hands. So uh, fights, accidents, uh, mistreatment of subordinates, violence against superior officers, and crimes involving unnatural sexual acts became more frequent. This sounds like just a night at the pub. Uh, yep. Yep. And so the commander in chief of the German military, who's General Walther von Baruch, Bar Bar well, I don't think he's going to listen to this, so that's okay. Baruch. Uh, concluded that his troops were committing the most serious infractions of morality and discipline and that the culprit was alcohol abuse. Shocking. He's like, oh no, their swastikas <laughs> are on crooked. Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> Are we the baddies? <laughs> God. Maybe they realized that when they were drunk and high. Are we the bad guys? I mean, yeah, you'd probably, like, if you take a step back, if you think about, and I'm not trying to humanize any of the terrible shit that any of these monsters did, but if you take a step back and you think about these young people who were probably drafted because they ended up you know, like the military ended up depleting so many of its soldiers and these young people who are exposed to meth and alcohol and then all of these heinous fucking war crimes, like the nightmares that had to ensue after that. But you can't forget about the ideology that was instilled in them through the state run education. Yeah. I mean, it's it's it, again, not trying to humanize any of the shit that happened, but like thinking about it from that perspective, I cannot even imagine being in that situation i mean have you seen jojo rabbit uh, no you know that i haven't i haven't either but <laughs> they're like eight-year-olds carrying grenade launchers yeah i mean it's it's crazy so because this alcohol use and abuse became so rampant and it was humiliating i'm, I'm sure in their minds uh hitler tried to curb the reckless use of alcohol and promised severe punishment for soldiers who exhibited public drunkenness or otherwise allowed themselves to be tempted to engage in criminal acts as a result of alcohol abuse. <laughs> uh, and really just to take it to the extreme, if you got too drunk and uh, made an ass of yourself, uh, they said that you could expect a humiliating death. What could that be? I actually want to know. I'm not going to Google that. Um, but if anyone else happens to, uh, let us know what you find. We won't tell you what it is, but it is really bad to hear it. <laughs> You would be so embarrassed. 
God. Okay. So this revised policy accompanied an increase in Nazi party disapproval of alcohol use in the civilian sector, reflecting an extension to alcohol of the longstanding Nazi condemnation of tobacco consumption as diminishing the strength and purity of the Aryan race. Oh, it's dodging it up. Uh, yeah. Again, you could smoke meth, um, like maybe drink a little bit, but if you have a cigarette, oh. You're going to Aryan hell. Yeah, that's that's pretty bad. Which is France or Russia. <laughs> so uh, we're going to fast forward a little bit and we're going to cut to the chase. Hitler was totally a fucking drug addict. This is a shock. This is. So I the entire reason I started to look into this is because somebody maybe last week posted on Reddit this gif of Hitler at some sort of event in a very large crowd. And he is like what looks like going through withdrawals but he like i can't even explain it he's just like rocking back and back and forth in his seat uh like super super high on something and so i started reading all the comments and people in the comments were like oh yeah hitler was totally high like at least 70 percent of the time during the war i had no idea they didn't teach me this in a catholic school (laughs) there was that movie uh kung fury (laughs) <laughs> the documentary <laughs> the documentary kung fury yes um i don't think he was ever high but he did time travel no he shot a cop through a phone yes yeah is it the police yeah <laughs> <laughs> um and so hitler's addiction i i think maybe started um because he was getting drugs prescribed to him to treat his chronic medical conditions whatever those were and there's this doctor named Theodore Morel who prescribed cultures of live bacteria and Hitler's digestive ailments eased and Hitler made him his primary physician. And so after that, this doctor became super popular and people dubbed him the Reich master of the injections. Uh, but I think that was also maybe like a sarcastic nickname. I'm unsure. Um, so <laughs> Dr. Morel goes on to prescribe powder cocaine to soothe Hitler's throat and clear his sinuses. You know, behind the scenes moment here, I'm actually researching um, what Hitler's problem was medically. (laughs) I think there's a lot of problems there. Um, It was actually um, a small (laughs) pee-pee. It was a small pee-pee. South Park has an episode talking about everyone who's angry in the world. It's well because of that. And Hitler's up there with the angriest. Yeah. Um, Don't think it worked. Okay. Yeah, I'm I'm not going to Google that again. Uh, So to wrap that up, maybe a fun fact. (laughs) Can can you have fun Nazi facts? Well, so Hitler's drug supplies run out uh, by the end of the war, and he ended up suffering severe withdrawal from serotonin and dopamine. He had paranoia, (laughs) psychosis, rotting teeth, extreme shaking, kidney failure, and delusion. I think his first delusion was thinking he could be an artist. (laughs) Okay, well, we're just going to wrap it up. That's a lifelong delusion right there. Have you seen his paintings? They're boring. All right, well, I don't really know how to continue after that. (laughs) What's the aftermath? You tell me. (laughs) (laughs) Where does this all lead? Well, we uh, we we know where it ends. Yeah, the we, Nazis lose yeah, in yeah. dramatic fashion. After the war, uh, what's become of Pervitin and meth and drugs and etc. in general? Pervitin remained easily accessible both on the black market and as a prescription. Doctors prescribed it as an appetite suppressant. Or they prescribed it in order to improve the moods of patients who were struggling with depression. <laughs> oh, you're feeling bad? Have this drug. If you stop taking it, you'll feel even worse. Yeah, I... Oh, my God. It's amazing how far science has come, truly. Yeah, yeah. And uh, students, especially medical students, turned to the stimulant because it enabled them to cram through the night and finish their studies faster. The drug was removed from the medical supplies of East and West Germany in the 1970s and 80s, respectively, and following German reunification, it was deemed illegal in the entire country. 
nowadays a different form of the drug. Crystal methamphetamine. Uh, crystal meth. Crystal. Crystal meth, a.k.a. Um, Florida? Jesse, we need to cook. <laughs> Uh, no, crystal meth has become popular throughout Europe and the United States, despite governmental prohibition and efforts to get rid of it. So I think that kind of wraps up how the Third Reich, one, came to power, but two, uh, how drugs played a huge role. And I feel like that is not something that I was taught in school. Um, it was a new thing that I learned, so I hope maybe you guys learned something new, too. Yeah, do you uh, do you think that the Nazis would have done better in the war had they not used meth? I was trying to think about that earlier. I don't know if they would have done better or if they would have done worse. Because if you think about, I mean, I, I could maybe see it both ways in the sense that I, I don't know if they would have gotten as far as they did had they not drugged up those soldiers. Um I think meth or not, you can't beat Russia in a Russian winter. Yeah, no, that's that's stupid. It's like legit throwing 30 million velociraptors <laughs> at Germans. Good, l- good luck. Meth or not, I, I think I'd rather be on something when I'm getting mauled by the Russian military in a cold Russian winter than be fully present for it. Yeah, no, I, I, I can agree with that. But I am neither a Nazi nor... A drug addict. Yes. Yes. Uh, so I hope that you learned something new today. Whether I've it's learned just, a lot. Yeah, whether it's just don't do meth. Um, or if you found this topic super interesting, because I know I have, and I would be interested in looking into this, but for other countries. Um, if you want to read more, we obviously will have our show notes like we always do, but there's also a book that's highly recommended for this topic called Blitzed Drugs in Nazi Germany. I see what they did there. Yes. <laughs> and so it uh, goes into great detail about all of this. So I would just consider this pod episode scratching the surface. Just barely. I mean, I yeah. didn't know any of this, but what I do know is, is that I sure won't do drugs. I won't have an attitude. I will resist. I, I will respect myself. And, and I will e. educate. Oh, education. That's yeah, right. Educate myself. And I will not go to the, the specific corner where they sell drugs from 3 to 7 p.m. Um, Monday through Thursdays. And I also know that there are many ways to say no to drugs. <laughs> like, nah, that ain't cool. And, and also... And you snap walk away. And also, sorry, I called my mom and she said no, so I can't. That's always a good one. So yeah, thanks so much for joining us this week. Hope that you found this really interesting because I know that we did. Um, and we hope to see you next week. We release two episodes every Monday on your favorite platform of choice. And don't forget, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can also send us a note at boostedconfusedpodcast at gmail.com. And if you would like to support the pod, uh, we promise, um, you know, we don't take donations or like buy me a coffee or anything. We don't have a Patreon or anything like that. But if we did, I promise we wouldn't take that money and spend it on meth. (laughs) Coffee, probably. (laughs) Probably coffee. Maybe some more mead from the Wild Blossom Meadery and Winery. Maybe some booze. Um, but the best way that you could actually support us and any podcast that you listen to is by leaving us a review on your platform of choice. And if you leave a review and you take a screenshot and you send it to us, we will send you some Boost and Confuse stickers for free and we would really appreciate it. So we, uh, hope to see you guys next week, I guess. Yeah. My glass is empty. So I guess we're done with the pod. Yeah, I guess, I guess that's it. You know what I'm going to do now? What are you going to go do now? Not meth. (laughs) Don't. Just don't do meth. Goodbye, everybody. Bye.